Hello and welcome. I'm Michael Cunningham. I'm Executive Director of Oxford University's North American office based in New York. And on behalf of my colleagues in the North American office and, and throughout the University of Oxford community, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome you here today. And I know my colleagues join me in saying that wherever you may be joining us from, we hope that you are well and that you and your family remain safe and healthy during these challenging times. To be honest, I wish we were meeting in person and that I was welcoming you to a, a big ballroom somewhere uh, where we are having an opportunity to see one another and interact and, uh, and exchange experiences uh, as we do through our alumni programs throughout the North American uh, program. It's hard to think of a bright spot during a global pandemic, considering how many people have suffered and uh, been uh, lost uh, throughout this year. One small positive is the way these new technologies have allowed us to interact with our alumni and friends all around the world. And the Meeting Minds Global Program is a testament to the global nature of the Oxonian alumni community. When we knew we weren't able to do alumni events in person, we joined together with our colleagues in the office in Oxford and also those in uh, Hong Kong and Tokyo in order to create this week-long program of events. And so thank you for joining us today. This is the first event sponsored by the North American office. We wanted to start, start off with a really good one and we think we have. Um, a little bit of groundkeeping. Uh, if you have a question, please uh, note it in the Q&A section. Our moderator will do his best to get through uh, as many questions as possible. If you could also note your college and year uh, or your affiliation with Oxford, uh, that might help boost your question up the list and inspire the moderator to acknowledge it. Uh, this session, as I mentioned, is being recorded. Uh, if you're not able to stay with us the entire session, come on back and watch the end. But also if you think it's wonderful, point it out to your fellow Oxonians and friends and encourage them to watch it uh, in its recorded version as well. Um, and again, as I mentioned, there'll be sessions throughout the week, uh, usually two, three, four a day. Uh, so please come back and watch more of the sessions. Uh, and we hope you enjoy them and find them edifying and, and interesting across the board. This first session, I think, is a great testament to the, the power, the staying power of Oxford. We like to think of Oxford as always being the best university in the world, the oldest university in the world. But in fact, that's not the case. Uh, it has, it's not the oldest university in the world. The former chancellor, Lord Jenkins, used to point out that actually Bologna is an older university and for centuries was the center of learning and higher education in Europe. But sadly, its star faded. While Oxford's star not only rose, but continues to shine very brightly. And, and Lord Jenkins' theory, which one I happen to agree with, it was the reason Oxford has done such an amazing job of staying so strong throughout the centuries. It's its ability to attract students, not just from the UK, but from all around the world, students and faculty who come to Oxford to discuss and examine and research the most vexing and challenging problems of that day. And, and this session we think is a wonderful illustration of the international interdisciplinary global approach that Oxford takes to really challenging questions. Uh, artificial intelligence is going to be one of the great, interesting, challenging aspects of our lives as we move forward. Uh, it has great potential, but also uh, comes with great peril. And the ethical questions associated with AI are something that need to be looked at very carefully. And we believe that Oxford is the ideal place in which to look at these questions. And so happily, the university has formed an institute for ethics and AI. It grows out of the philosophy department and will be based in the new uh, Schwarzman Center for the Humanities, which will bring together seven faculties in the humanities under one roof. We'll have a new humanities library and many other features. So right from the start, the Institute for Ethics and AI will be highly disciplinary uh, and will be able to bring in resources uh, that will allow it to succeed in its important mission. And the resources that really it will bring together most importantly, of course, are people, uh, which is always the case at Oxford. Um, and so this session today, again, is a microcosm of the way that the Institute for Ethics and AI is being able to bring people together uh, and examine these important questions. We have a great panel, uh, two um, alumni, uh, two members who are Oxonian alumni and uh, a member of the academic community. Uh, to begin with, we have um, joining us Reed Hoffman, who uh, is originally from California. Uh, Reed is one of the most accomplished entrepreneurs and investors of his generation. Uh, he has traveled to, he traveled to Oxford from uh, California again as a Marshall Scholar, uh, was at Wolfson College where he earned his 
MA in philosophy. Uh, Reap has played a pivotal role in many of today's leading to consumer technology companies, including PayPal, of course, was the co-founder of LinkedIn, um, and is also now a partner at Greylock, the, part, uh, the, the venture firm Greylock Partners. Um, he is also the author of three best-selling books, The Startup of You, The Alliance, and Blitz, Blitz Scaling. He is also the host of the wonderful Masters of Scale podcast. Um, Reed was appointed uh, a, a commander of the Order of the British Empire, CBE, uh, in recognition for his service to promoting UK business and social networking and his work on behalf of the Marshall Scholarships Program. So Reed, thank you for joining us today. Um, also on the panel with Reed is a member of the Oxford Academic Community, uh, and that is Dr. Carissa Valise. Carissa is a native of Spain, and she has received her DPhil in philosophy while a member of Christ Church at Oxford. Uh, she's currently an associate professor with the Faculty of Philosophy and the Institute for Ethics and AI, as well as a tutorial fellow at Hartford College. Her research uh, really interests um, involve political philosophy, practical ethics, and digital ethics, and, and especially the question of questions related to privacy. Her latest book entitled Privacy is Power was recognized by The Economist magazine as one of the books of the year. Uh, she's also the editor of the forthcoming Oxford Handbook of Digital Ethics. And so thank you for joining us, Carissa. Uh, and our other Oxonian panelist is Dr. James Minica. Uh, James is a senior fellow, senior, sorry, senior partner at McKinsey Company and chairman and director of McKinsey Global Institute. Uh, James uh, attended Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar from Zimbabwe. Um, he received his MA, MSc, and DPhil uh, and from Oxford in AI and robotics, mathematics, and computer science. And he was uh, a member of uh, Keeble and Balliol College. Uh, at McKinsey, James has worked with some of the leading chief executives and founders of uh, many of the leading technology companies in the world. Uh, he has led research on AI and the digital economy and the future of work and other global trends. James serves on the board of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. On the advisory board, at, he's on advisory boards happily at Oxford, but also at Stanford and MIT. Uh, and he is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine's Com Committee on Responsible Com Computing and Research and its Applications. Uh, James is also a distinguished fellow of the Stanford AI Institute, a fellow of DeepMind. And last but certainly not least, we'll be a visiting fellow at All Souls College. Our moderator for the discussion is Professor John Tasoulis. Uh, John is the founding director of the Institute for Ethics and AI and professor of ethics and legal philosophy at Oxford. Uh, and John is widely re recognized as one of the le world's leading authorities uh, mor moral, of moral and legal philosophy. Uh, John attended Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar from his native Australia and received his DSPhil in philosophy as a member of Balliol College. He went on to hold permanent appointments at Oxford, University of College London, King's College London, as well as visiting appointments at Harvard, University of Chicago, University of Melbourne. Uh, John has been a consultant at the World Bank and has been co-editor of the Philosophy of International Law, which is published by OUP and considered one of the central texts in that field. But my panelists had encouraged me to keep the introduction short and brief, but when you have such an accomplished panel, uh, it's difficult to do. Uh, we are highly international. Uh, perhaps in the future, we'll include uh, an Oxonian um, from China to get a, a, an even more global view of this uh, important topic. Um, but again, we are just delighted with the group that we've assembled. And so thank you all for joining. Uh, and without further ado, I'll turn the proceedings over to uh, Professor John Sisoulis. Thank you so much, Michael, for that very kind introduction. And it's a really great pleasure to be discussing um, AI ethics with three such interesting and accomplished panelists. And I'm gonna encourage them all to actually appear and to switch on their videos. Um, to orient our discussion, um, I think it would be useful to begin by getting a sense from each of our panelists of why they believe that AI ethics is important now, and also perhaps to tell us what they think um, they would like the Oxford Institute ideally to achieve in this domain. So perhaps I could begin by directing that question to Reid. 
John, I think this is uh, super important. It's obviously one of the reasons why we're all here together. Um, look, I think part of what's happening is we all know there's this digital transformation of society uh, by which, you know, kind of software is, is kind of uh, transforming all industries and aspects of society. And artificial intelligence is the exponential uh, impact of that as it amplifies in, in various ways that transformation. And currently, of course, uh, AI is being primarily developed by a small number of, of corporations. It's in a fairly black box uh, form and methodology and there's extreme competition across those corporations. And so this creates um, a, a ethical question in multiple dimensions, uh, not just ethical products, which is how people normally think of this, but what is ethical development? Uh, where do the roles of power and accountability uh, come into? Um, how do the interlapping kind of industry competition, nation state competition, other kinds of things play into this? And how does that go? And so the, the question is urgent and present and now. And then in terms of um, the kind of the, the institute at Oxford, um, to, to borrow from a um, kind of a business terminology, OKR, it's objectives and key results. You know, I would say that uh, Oxford brings uh, so many key components to this discussion. It's a trusted, global, strong, multidisciplinary research university. It is strong across AI, philosophy, uh, pol politics, economics, business, others. It has a strong convening power, uh, trusted by multiple society stakeholders. And what I'd hope is ideas, not just on, of course, how to be ethical in each of these dimensions, but also how to discourse. Uh, where is transparency in this discourse critical? What do we need to have public visibility on in order to achieve the right kinds of outcomes? Because in engaging each of these stakeholders for better outcomes, whether it's obviously products and product development, policies, laws, research, uh, you're gonna have to have this kind of ideation across it. And I think Oxford is a very great place for that. Fantastic, thank you so much. James, can I move to you? Well, th th thank you, John. I'm delighted to be part of this uh, impressive uh, group. I, I think we don't, we don't have a choice but really tackle these questions related to AI and ethics because we haven't had a technology, at least not, not in, to this extent anyway, where we're starting to have to think about societal implications in a fundamental way. We're having to start to think about what it means to be human. We're having to start to think about the role of humans. Uh, where do we want humans to be in charge? Where do we not want them to be in charge? We're having to think about uh, all these questions we've never really had to think about with a technology that kind of changes how we participate in the world. So issues ranging from whether it's privacy and surveillance or bias and discrimination uh, become very important. Questions about you know, other you know, effects of AI that have uh, ethical implications in terms of impacting people's livelihoods. Think about the impact on work, a uh, sense of dignity, sense of place in the world. Those become very, very important uh, questions. And then you ultimately get to the big ones, right? You get to the big questions, which is, okay, so where do we want these technologies to make decisions for us? Where do we not? Where do we want human participation? Uh, where do we not? What, what counts as uh, beneficial use versus misuse? These are deeply ethical questions. Uh, and you know, one of my favorite questions that we're gonna need to grapple with eventually is, you know, uh, how do we align all of this with values? Which values? Whose values? Uh, you know, is there a normative view to that question? Do you want these machines to do as, I, as we say, uh, do as I do, uh, do as I ought to do, uh, do as society wants them to do? So how do we even think about these questions of value alignment? I think these are really, really hard questions. And I would hope that, um, you know, uh, you and your colleagues at Oxford can tackle both the big questions, but I also think that the practical questions matter too, because the practical questions are already here. And by the practical questions, I'm talking about these questions of bias, privacy, uh, surveillance, these are already here before we even get to when we get to general intelligence and we have to grapple with the larger, larger questions. So I hope to see both kinds of work at Oxford, both the big, big questions, but also the practical questions that I could be quite frankly, very helpful to uh, create a foundations for developers and appliers of, uh, of AI. That's really, really um, 
helpful point, James, because your emphasis on the fundamental nature of the questions, I think, clears up a potential misconception. A lot of people think of ethics as simply one form of regulation amongst others, in particular kind of self-regulation that doesn't involve legal sanctions. But our understanding of ethics is that precisely it deals with these fundamental questions to any form of regulation, whatever that happens to be. And that's why you need the resources of a discipline like philosophy, which is the discipline that is most comfortable at addressing those questions. Carissa, can I move to you with that same set of questions? Yes, thank you. I think that we really need AI ethics right now because the alternative is very likely on a unethical AI and irresponsible AI. Ethics doesn't happen just by chance. Um, if people don't sit and think about how do we manage to build these tools so that they can contribute to well-being and not harm people, it's just not going to happen on its own. And we're already seeing how algorithms are having very nefarious effects um, in many people, especially the worst off, which is particularly concerning. And I would like to see the Institute to be, on the one hand, a kind of uh, place in which we can liaise between different disciplines. Of course, philosophy, but also computer science and sociology and anthropology and politics and mathematics and physics. And there's so many disciplines involved in this project, but also liaise with different sectors of the population, um, users and different people who are concerned and who are affected by these tools. And of course, with uh, po policymakers and NGOs and all kinds of actors within the public sphere. And I would like us to help and contribute to the debate in reflecting how do we build a society in which we want to live in and we want our kids to live in, as opposed to building a society in which we're kind of sleepwalking into kind of certain dystopian um, flavors that are quite worrisome. And I would also like the Institute to offer some education and reflection in the sense of um, in the 1950s, you could be a doctor and never have heard of bioethics, more or less, except for the Hippocratic um, oath. Now you cannot become a doctor without, without having at least one class in bioethics. And in the future, I would like to see computer scientists and data analysts and so forth, at least having one taste of like, what is data ethics and what are some of the risks and um, just have a sense of, of the landscape. Thank you so much. Let me ask a question, a kind of devil's advocate question that I sometimes get, which is that people understand how you could be an expert in AI, but how can you be an expert in ethics? So if you set up an institute of ethics, in what sense is there a form of expertise there? And a kind of supplementary question to that, isn't it fundamentally undemocratic to think that there are experts who can define values as opposed to values being defined by some democratic process? Does anyone want to wrestle with that hot potato? Well, we should ultimately hand it over to Carissa, of course, as one of the experts here. But I think I'll do a little bit of help from the business side of things on this and, and why this is actually important from the, the non-partisan to the academic expert and other kinds of ways of this, which is, um, look, obviously the public participation and ethical questions and being able to frame so that we can, we can get a sense of it is obviously super important. It's actually part of where expertise goes. But also the question about like, well, thinking about what does the future look like? What is that impact, that visualization of it? Thinking in, in cases that persuade people because of logic and reasoning. Like everyone can do some reasoning. Some people, you know, spend many more hours, reason better, and then presenting it in a way that you go, oh, I understand what that is. And so it isn't, you know, be a, be a priest, you know, coming down from the mountainside and just tell me what it is without any, you know, like, you know, your, your ethics, the answer to your ethics question is 42. You know, it, it's actually, in fact, um, you know, like, oh, that's the way to think about this. And that's the way to think about this as a dynamic system about where we're going. And I think that's part of the reason why having experts come into and participate with the business realm and the policy realms and other kinds of things is actually super helpful. Yeah, I think um, we're not purporting to be philosopher kings, but if we could yes. somehow model civil and rational debate and feed that into a wider discourse. I think that would be achieving something. Anyone else want to get into that question? Yeah, I really agree with that perspective. I think that that idea comes very much from an idea of religion as like the priest or the Brahmin who has this <laughs> special access to God and tells you essentially um, what to do. And, but th there are at least two reasons why 
ethicists might have something to contribute to the debate. There, there are more, but at least two. One is that we have the time for it. We're paid for it. So, I mean, people are busy and you have to pay taxes and do your daytime job and uh, take care of your kids, all kinds of things. This is our job. We spend eight hours a day thinking about these issues. Um, and furthermore, we have some experience as a discipline. So in this regard, I think there's a lot to learn from medical ethics. Uh, in the 1950s, medical ethics did not exist and it developed as a result of very concerning scandals, which we're having now in the digital realm, and new technology that um, made doctors face new challenges that they didn't quite know how to grapple. And again, the, the, the analogy of the digital case is very, very close. And we can learn from them. We can learn from what kinds of challenges they faced and how they solved them and what kinds of procedures they use. And of course, medical ethics is very different from digital ethics and much will have to be adapted. Um, but there is a lot of experience there from which to learn from. Great. Let me ask another question sort of around this area. The Institute will be embedded in a center for the humanities. Is there some credence to the idea that we need a more humanistic approach to ethics that perhaps in AI, more formal or quantitative conceptions of ethics have tended to predominate as in, well, find out what people's preferences are and maximize those preferences. Maybe there's something to be learned, not just from philosophers, but novelists, people in the humanities more widely. Any thoughts on this? Well, I, I think, I think you're, you're spot on, John, in this. I think we need all of the above because, uh, par partly because, you know, if you think about how do we, you know, when we think about um, the moral values that hold any society together, many of those are often found in stories in narratives in mythology and myths in beliefs uh, in stories about struggle and stories about so and a lot of that comes out of the humanities. I mean, philosophy itself in arguably. So I think we need all of the above. I think on the one hand, though, on the other hand, though, I, you know, maybe this is a little bit of a comment on the earlier question, too. It's not clear to me that uh, it's going to be one or the other in the sense of it's going to be the experts or, uh, or a democratic process, because I'm not quite sure we want one or the other. I'm not quite sure we want to crowdsource our ethics uh, in, 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 in any sense. Um, we, we, you know, we know sometimes what happens when you do that. At the same time, I don't think we want to just rely on experts either. So I think there's going to need to be some engagement here. Uh, between uh, both the experts and, 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 and democratic societies, but also between humanists as well as um, uh, technical scientific uh, folks who are developing these technologies. One of the things, by the way, that the technologists or the AI researchers bring to this is at least they will give us a sense of the scope of possibilities around which we should ask questions because knowing what the technology can do also helps us understand what kinds of questions therefore should the humanists and others be asking and how should we be engaging in those dialogues? Yeah, that is a great point. And one of the first things that I did as director, James, is to establish a reading group together with the scientists working in AI computer science precisely to ensure that the ethical theorizing is attuned to the realities of what's going on. Reed, did you want to jump in on this before we move on? Yeah. I mean. Part of the thing that is amazing about the kind of the AI technology is, and but it is some of the history of all technologies have evolved some of what it is to be human and our conceptions of what the human is and the transformation of that. And AI will be particularly strong in that. Um, you know, we already see it in that kind of the, the, the mirror image of, well, you know, humans are special because they're chess players. Well, actually, in fact, well, maybe not. Maybe it's other things, <laughs> right? But that notion of, of what is a humanist agenda is, I think, super important. And I think that the way that that dialogue, because I think that's what essentially James was gesturing at, is how to get the right participants in that dialogue, uh, as opposed to like, you know, any one set, you know, being the, you know, ex cathedra, <laughs> right way of, of, of talking. And I think that's super important. And the humanism goes, you know, not just from obviously literature and all the rest, but even such things as, you know, um, I actually think that, and James, I was, I'm, I'm very hopeful that science fiction will start playing a role again. Um, I, I, you know, it's, it's, you have to be envisioning the future. Yeah, absolutely. We've advertised a couple of topics we should really get around to, privacy and work. So AI applications often dependent on huge data sets. The, compiling these data sets raises serious questions about surveillance and about privacy. Now, Carissa, 
your book, Privacy is Pal, has just been published in the US. I just want to point out, Carissa did not pay me to mention this. <laughs> going to pay me later. Um, but in the book, you argue that not only do we have the right to privacy that others have an obligation to respect, but that also that we have duties of privacy not to disclose our own personal data in certain contexts. And from this, you draw quite um, a strong conclusion about the need, in effect, to abolish the data economy. Could you say something about that book? And we can maybe get a, a discussion going on around your main contentions. Yeah, thank you. One of my worries is that there's this kind of misleading idea that privacy is only individual, it's just a personal preference. And I argue that no, privacy is important because it's actually a collective enterprise and a political concern. So what moral authority do I have to give out my data if that data is going to be used to profile other voters and try to sway an election? That's not my data, that's our data and that's our democracy. So one of my worries is that the link between surveillance and control societies, authoritarian societies is extremely, extremely close. And we are building the perfect surveillance structure to create a regime that we couldn't possibly topple because as soon as we start thinking about it, just searching for something or reading something controversial or messaging somebody who might have a reputation for being at the center, then we would be censored, we would be found, we would be um, repressed. And that really worries me. I think what we're doing is quite risky and possibly quite stupid and that we should think twice. Great, so Chris's book is a sort of very powerful um, wake up call for people who haven't been paying attention to these issues. But there's also another side where there are some people who are making the claim, well, actually, you know, in the era of AI, we need to reconfigure the right to privacy. We need to think about the right to privacy in a new way so as to release the potential of AI. I think um, it was you, James, who co-authored a report where you said that one of the bottlenecks in the development of AI is the availability of data, the accessibility of data. So how do we, how do we square that? Do we also though need to perhaps reconfigure, rethink our ideas about privacy in response to these new realities? Well, I, I think we, I think we do, John, and I think at least I can think of at least uh, two ways in which we need to do that, and maybe there are others. Um, one is what uh, Carissa just described, which is it's not always individual, but there's a collective sense of the of the of the of the data and the privacy of it, because often our individual data has other these cascading impacts on other people, uh, and in fact, even the economic value of that often goes up when it's combined with other people's data. So it's not so much of an individual choice as much, and I think Carissa made that point. But to further complicate things though, here's, here's where it gets complicated. Sometimes the, 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 the use of this data is actually for society's benefit. Think about in, in the context of things like health and healthcare and safety, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I, I happened to, of the course of uh, 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 last year, I happened to be actually two years, the last two years, I was co-chairing a uh, future work commission for the state of California. And, in, you know, the first year of that commission was before COVID and the second year was during COVID. Before COVID, we were having these incredibly concerned conversations about uh, data and surveillance in the workplace. And of course, there was huge concern about that because you know we don't want to surveil workers, we don't want to be make sure we, we protect their privacy, etc. It was quite interesting to see how the tenor of the com and the concerns were coming from workers themselves. By the way, it was quite interesting to see how the tenor of that conversation changed during COVID, because now all of a sudden there was a softening and even an interest in in doing that data collection, if in fact it was going to be helpful to making people keeping workers safe if we had a much better system of understanding who had been exposed to what and so forth, it was actually seen as a collective good for the safety, health and safety of the workers. So I think it, it then forces us to grapple with these questions about, are there some situations where we would say, and under what guidance and under what governance would we say, it's actually for the collective good to be able to manage and aggregate these data sets in other situations where we say, no, it's actually more harmful in, in, in overall and I think we're hoping that you, know, you and your colleagues will help us think through those questions about how do we think about those trade-offs and choices and situations? Is it very use case specific? Uh, is it context specific? Is it 
for certain classes of uh, protected rights and behaviors? How do we even navigate that? Yeah, so I think this is a really important point that the scope of privacy protection has to be sensitive also to other values, and in particular, the purposes for which a particular application is being deployed. And I think the public health case is a particularly powerful one. I mean, there were three European academic networks recently that claimed that the EU's GDPR was inhibiting health research because it was preventing uh, sharing of data. So, that, so that's, I think it was 5,000 projects in 2019 alone were affected in this way. So, I mean, there are two questions here. One is about the value of privacy and then the particular way of institutionalizing it. If you institutionalize it legally, then that creates the possibility of a chilling effect that people are hyper worried about getting on the wrong side of the law and then take excessive measures. Reed, do you want to say something on this? A couple of things. Um, look, so first is, uh, I think that Chris is exactly right that there is a concern about power and autocracy and these kinds of things in this. And I think all of us share that. Um, and, you know, I think we all also know that there's very clearly cases where, you know, kind of, uh, you know, like there's some trade-off of a massive social benefit versus some individual challenges. I mean, say for example, you say, well, we put in a whole bunch of different cancer data all in one place and we cure cancer, which saves lots and lots of lives. And some people are outed as, well, you didn't know for whatever reason, it's like some things like, oh, you have cancer or something else. It's like, well, saving lots of lives seems like the much greater good as an instance of it. Now, the problem, the, the thing to kind of navigate in all this is that it's a very dynamic system. Like we're not going to be able to, to just say, well, here are the three principles and here's what we do. We have to have a dynamic and kind of evolving system on this. And part of that dynamic system is not just like we have to think about this as, as being in a in a in a global circumstance. So, for example, Kai Fu Lee's book on AI and superpowers was that China is going to win this battle because they are going to essentially put all of the data in and allow that to happen. So then they're going to generate the next generation of technologies. Ultimately, people do adopt those technologies because whatever the technology is that works, that will also be industry and power disbalancing. Of course. They'll be using these things as they are today for like monitoring uh, dissent and Uyghurs and other kinds of things, which is a real challenge and not good for, I think, what the organizations of humanity want. But how do we, we, we work through that muddle of how these things are happening? And, and, and part of the dynamic system is, you know, normally when you're trying to do thinking, you say, everyone slow down and let's just sort this out. It's like, well, I'm not sure slowing down is actually in this global circumstance. is actually, in fact, really in the cards, other than it may have an, a, a bad ethical outcome for doing that. So we have to figure out how to operationalize at speed going, okay, here's some principles. And that's part of the reason this dialogue and discourse is so important and bringing multiple uh, shareholders to it is kind of so important because we're going to be kind of doing it on the fly and uh, evolving because of the nature of the global ecosystem um, uh, for what's happening already. So for example, all of the face rec facial recognition technologies are already in full-blown, you know, iteration and development in China, whereas, you know, kind of in the U.S. and in Europe, it's like, well, okay, these parts are good, these parts are bad, we don't know, you know, like, well, what is, how does that play out? Yeah. Carissa, do you want to come back? I know you're skeptical about the public health arguments for um, diluting privacy protection, so maybe you want to talk about that or anything else that's been said so far. Sure. So on the one hand, I'm sympathetic. I mean, of course, everybody wants better medicine and, and COVID has been terrifying. So of course, you know, every, everybody wants that. Um, but I worry about a few things. One thing is that this argument is used for just anything. Okay, so, okay, so because we need data for medicine, let's just sell it for uh, personalized ads. And that just doesn't follow at all. So that's one concern that, that medicine is used sometimes um, in, in ways that are questionable. Another concern is that sometimes we don't actually need the kind of uh, intrusions that companies argue for. So for instance, one example in, in the context of COVID was, well, it turned out that apps weren't that important to fight the pandemic. We needed uh, vaccines, we needed treatment, we needed masks, uh, but actually apps didn't play that big a role as we thought they might at the beginning. And so there's worries that, that there might be a power grab whenever there's a crisis. So of course we can't stop and think uh, because like we have urgent problems to deal with, but at the same time, we can't just say yes 
just in case it might be helpful and then end up sleepwalking into a control society. Yeah, I think Actually, you're right about the apps. So let me add in one thing there. So sure, please. You have to think about apps. Look, at, and, and the questions about, I think the Western corporations are trying to figure out how to also be privacy with contact tracing and all the rest, and we're making real efforts in this. Apps in China have actually made a very big difference because in, in the autocracy, what they essentially did is, okay, you have an app that is, you, you can't get into the buildings and their, their economy has been back and everyone's been going out in the streets, dining in restaurants for months uh, for this, because what they have is you have an app that you have to have if you want to gain into the building, that, that app will go, will, will go passport denied if in a contact tracing you show that you have to go get tested. So you immediately have to go quarantine and go get tested. And that allowed them to much in advance of a lot of vaccinations to be operational. And, and so it's not apps generally can't work. It's a question of how you do it. Now that's within an autocratic society and there's other strong downsides on kind of a surveillance autocratic society which I completely agree with. But it's to say, don't, don't overly generalize just like apps don't work. Yeah, I think no, absolutely. With, with the British case was there was an over-reliance on apps by themselves, but they need to be in a broader setting. So if someone knows that they have COVID and then the issue is, okay, you should not go to work, but okay, what happens? How do I pay my bills at that point, et cetera? So the app by itself cannot be the answer. I think that's absolutely right. Let's move on to this issue of work since I've just mentioned work. Um, James, you had some terrifying statistics in one of your reports. You found that 50% of work activities could be made automatable. That's amazing. Um, does this stoke the fear that in effect, employment will be devastated by um, AI developments with the consequent rise of inequalities, alienation and social conflict? Uh, not really. Uh, in the following sense. So, you know, it's, I think I'm glad you pointed out. So the the 50 percent or close to 50 percent is act, automatable activities. Keep in mind that anyone's occupation is an, an, an amalgam of different activities. And in fact, in that same study, in that same research, and I think the OECD research has found something similar. If you look at, say, in the United States, where the Bureau of Labor tracks roughly 800 occupations, uh, occupation types, uh, we actually found that uh, only about 10% of those occupations have something like almost 100% of their activities, constituent activities that are automatable. Uh, so then it, it feels hopefully a lot less scary. This is looking at the next 20 years, by the way. It looks a lot less scary. And we also found, for example, that in fact, something like 60% of occupations have about a third of their constituent activities that will be automatable. So that probably says more jobs will change than will be lost. Uh, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, and never mind all the jobs that will be gained. But, but, but to, to come back to your point, though, there are still things to worry about with regards to the labor markets, by the way. And it is sort of even in the next 20 years. It's, so it's not the least of them for me is at least this idea of a jobless future. I don't worry about that in the next 20 years. But I do worry about the following things. I do worry about uh, the, the massive shifts in the skills that people are gonna need to be able to take up and participate in the jobs as they, that are gonna continue to grow. So there's a skill. So when everybody talks about reskilling, that's actually factually important and the data and the research supports that. But there are a few other things that perhaps get a lot less public attention at least. The second one is the amount of kind of uh, if you like, transitions from one occupation to another. We know that there are some jobs that are declining, have been declining, and will probably decline even faster, even as others rise. So how do we help people make the kind of transitions from the declining occupations to the growing occupations? Then there is, of course, the big one, right? The big elephant in the room, which is the effect on labor market and wages and incomes. So even as we have enough work, uh, I actually worry a lot that we might actually see even greater labor market wage polarization for a couple of reasons. One is that the fact that we know that most of the jobs that are growing pay a lot less, right? And many of these are the jobs that are growing. Many of them are the jobs that we know uh, are harder to automate. So think teachers, think caregivers. Uh, these are in, in some ways incredibly hard to automate and incredibly deeply human activities. But guess what? The labor markets don't pay those jobs very well. Uh, there's, there's some of the lowest paid occupations in the economy. So I worry about the wage 
uh, wage impacts, uh, quite frankly, and we don't talk enough about that. That's why I like the fact that we're having now a fun, important, but fun debate about UBI. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we can come back as to what we think about UBI, but I, what I like about that debate though, I think it's raising the question about what happens in a society when in fact the majority of people de derive their livelihood through their labor participation and labor participation no longer provides enough for people to live on because we found other ways to do that. What do we do in response? Yes, in that sense, UBI is one response, but there are many other responses, but that, that puts that question of income and wages at center stage. And I think that's a very important question to think about. There's the income aspect. There's also the, the meaning of one's life aspect, where for a lot of people, rightly or wrongly, work is the focus of a lot of meaning. And it's also part of one's status as a democratic citizen, that one is not simply a passive recipient of benefits, but also contributing. Reid, I think you're somewhat skeptical about UBI strategies. Well, I, I think James has framed it extremely well, which is, look, I think you have to take seriously the question is, if you don't have a plan for how people can continue to have good labor identities, both in kind of economics, uh, but also uh, dignity and meaningfulness, then you have to do something about it. UBI is one idea. I, uh, because, but James is already gesturing at some of the things where I have been hesitant about uh, UBI. So one of them is the meaningfulness. The, the, you know, as Aristotle, we, we are citizens of the polis. So we, we fit a place in society and, and having a place that I fit in is actually extremely important. And currently we use work as the, as the bulk you know, kind of participation in case and my role within community and society and, and rewards and so forth. So if not work, what does that look like? And so, you know, but on the other hand, by the way, there's a lot of different frames of UBI. We could say, well, UBI is a baseline to move the entire baseline up, but there will still be various work things on top of that. So it's kind of like various forms of, of either a baseline wage subsidy or various other ways of saying, hey, I get some wages here and they get subsidized in the following way of redistributing capital to labor, but still having that kind of ecosystem. But I think that the, the discussion is that I think that too often, a lot of my critique on the UBI side is that so we, oh, it's just easily solved, it's just the UBI. You're like, well, that's a, a bit more than that. And then what's more, when you begin to do the, the, the penciling of the economics, at least a lot of Silicon Valley people, they say, oh, UBI is gonna be here in five years. And you're like, no, 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 we're not gonna have this kind of dislocation, this ability to do that in a, in a broad brush uh, sense. I'm glad that people like OpenAI and other people are doing experiments now. You know, Stockton in California, I think are very important because you know, let's, let's not make the discussion entirely theoretical. Let's actually use some, some uh, experimentation and learning as also to inform our theories. Uh, but you know, that, there's a lot of variables here that are very important. Thank you so much, Reed. Let me just now move quickly to the questions because we have some fascinating questions from the audience. And one is from Volker Lang, Trinity 2008. He says, one aspect of AI is about finding hidden patterns in large amounts of data. Do you think AI will occasionally reveal entirely new ethical principles that humans have not yet discovered? Anyone want to take that one? Well, I'm happy to, although if Carissa is going to go, I will defer. <laughs> You go first. Okay. Um, and so, look, I, I, I also have a lot of excellent questions um, and not surprisingly from an Oxonian uh, audience. And I also uh, looked at that one as well. And I think the answer is yes in a couple of different ways, because I think part of it is not so much that it will be AGI and, and necessarily you'll have a, like, just like a GPT-3 or a GPT-4 like ethical essay that comes out of the data. Maybe, that's, that's also interesting. But I think that what's gonna happen is you're gonna begin to realize um, in these large patterns of data, what emerges out of them? And, and I think this is part of the substance of Carissa's earlier point, which is like, look, on medical stuff, it's really important. But on these other things, there's these surprising downsides too. So what we're going to be seeing by looking at large patterns and why we have to be active about it is, oh, here are potential downsides. Like, for example, what about, you know, like manipulations of democracy? We need to like prevent this kind of manipulation of democracy in some way. And that's a surprising downside from a large aggregation of data. And then some kind of new principles or heuristics may come from looking at that. And that's why you have to look at this as a dynamic system. I think that's part of where the discoveries will be. Chris, did you want to come in quickly before I move on? 
I largely agree. Um, I think that we're going to understand more about how people behave and that will inspire us to also think about the principles and revisit them and tweak them and possibly invent new ones. Like for example, what does it mean to manipulate someone informationally in the digital age? That's very different from how we used to manipulate people. Um, so yeah, I, I, I largely agree. For the record, I just want to say I'm very skeptical about crowdsourcing ethics, but there is an aspect like with Aristotle where he says, well, let's begin from common opinion and see whether that can be sustained. So that might fit into that kind of um, methodology, which is try to figure out what common sense says and then whether one needs to deviate. But I would be very doubtful that simply finding patterns in data of people's beliefs would be any kind of authoritative basis for what is ethical. A different question from what we should do in a democratic context. Another question from Jean-Louis Van Holtz, um, more than 2008. What role can AI play in optimizing corporate expenditure and household consumption for lower carbon footprints? And what are the ethical challenges in leveraging AI in this important area? James, do you want to take that one up? Well, um, one, one of the things that um, uh, is helpful is, is we know that uh, it's easy to use the AI techniques and machine learning techniques to better understand kind of uh, consumer behavior. I think by and large so far, it's probably been used in not always the best ways, but I think there's an opportunity to redirect this to more kind of productive, different kinds of consumption. So think about what typically happens uh, with in, in business models that are trying to drive engagement and consumption and participation. Uh, we can all debate whether we think that's a good thing or not, but imagine if that could be redirected towards uh, encouraging behaviors and giving nudges to kind of more kind of sustainable consumption and behaviors and activities. Uh, so I think there's possibilities to use AI to do that. Uh, we, we haven't had much of that so far, but I think there's an opportunity to actually do that. Great. Let me ask this question from David um, Balliol 2010. Some people have good reasons to create and use large data sets about people, e.g. tax authorities. What factors should they consider if they implement AI? Are they different if, if AI is used to process data versus automate decisions? Yeah. Well, definitely... Oh, go ahead, Chris. I think, I think it, it is an incredibly important question. And to illustrate my answer, I'll just cite an example. Um, a few years ago, the Michigan Unemployment Agency, it turns out that they were using an algorithm to try to figure out who was committing fraud. Uh, and it turns out that the algorithm was 93% uh, wrong, wrong 93% of the time. And it accused about uh, tens of thousands of people of fraud who didn't have a job and who lost their houses, who lost their families. And they only realized two years later what had happened when their lives had been broken. And you can't, you can't really fix that. So one really important thing to, um, to make sure is that the AI does what it says on the tin and you, that you can check. And you not check two years later, but check really, really uh, thoroughly. So one of the things that I've been arguing is that it's amazing that we don't have randomized control trials for algorithms. That's crazy. At the moment, you can pretty much design any algorithm, use it for anything you like, and there's no regulation. And that's a very scary thought. I think we should end on this last question from Richard Dudney, Balliol, 1984. Which governments are currently best regulating for ethical AI behavior? James, you might have the best visibility, but I think this, this is very much in its infancy. And I don't think there is, uh, I think the good news is, I think a lot of the governments realize that they could do a lot of harm by weighing in too heavily, too quickly. And that part of convocations like today's and others are extremely important for being, and that's the good news. Um, but the, you know, on the other hand, generally speaking, uh, governments figuring out how to shape the technology side has been a challenging area. And that's part of the reason why, you know, institutes like the Oxford Institute are extremely important uh, now more than ever. But I don't know if James has more to, or Carissa, I have more to add than that. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in, Reid, and I think you're, you're right, I tend to agree. It also raises the question, and maybe this is to throw it back to you, John, and your colleagues at Oxford to think through, which is, what does it even mean to regulate AI? So if you're asking, if the question is, is asking regulating the use of data, 
then you might say perhaps the Europeans have done better with GDPR and others because at least they've made some effort to think about that. But if the question is to regulate use and misuse of when we use AI algorithm versus not, that's a whole question that's very much in its infancy, yeah. uh, in, largely along the lines that Carissa just described, which is we don't even regulate when these things can be deployed and not uh, as much. You don't even, right, in which arenas, um, we, don't, we haven't even thought through that. Uh, we haven't even thought through how do we regulate, if you like, some of the uh, uh, scale market power considerations that come with AI. We know that, for example, these are scale technologies, and we know, therefore, things like compute are going to be, uh, you know, the cost of compute is going to, you know, is going to go up dramatically. It'll probably end up in a few places. But even that is changing, too, because we know that cloud computing is, is creating a democratization of the compute access to compute. So, so I think it's, this is still very much in its infancy. And it's a very much of a fast moving uh, thing. I think what complicates it for governments, by the way, is when you get to areas like national security, because then it gets really complicated because then you're dealing with what governments may choose to do for their own country, but they've got adversaries and competitors and competing nations. And you get into these great power competition debates and then it's a whole different set of questions about Absolutely. regulation and governance in that setting. So what if someone says, well, this whole discussion of AI ethics is very interesting in a hypothetical sense, but it's nugatory in effect because there is going to be a competition, technological competition between us and China. And so therefore, in a sense, just as people are skeptical that ethical um, considerations really apply in international relations, the same thing will be true of AI ethics. Is there any way to avoid that? Well, I was, I, was, I was hinting at this a little before, which is don't think ethics as slow us down. Think about ethics as, because uh, the real win is getting to the right outcomes. So to participate in the discussion at full speed, because by the way, getting the wrong outcomes, oh, we're competing and we get to the wrong outcomes. No, no, what matters is getting the right outcomes. So yes, competition speed, but have that dialogue and have that presence and try to get to the right outcomes. Right, because I'm thinking about um, that National Security Commission and AI report, that 700 page report. I have not read all 700 pages, but I know that a kind of headline idea is that China could soon be replacing the US as the world's AI superpower. And there are some pretty strong recommendations there saying that but in certain areas, at least, the US needs to stay at least two generations ahead of China. So that does look like this race is already happening. Is there the race is definitely on, you know, Kai-Fu Lee's book, you know, a whole stack of things. Right. One and reason for governments to, um, to, to be careful with data is just defensive. Like, hack, like China is really good at hacking. Do you want them to access all our personal data? Probably not. Another reason is that it might be the case that to develop real AI, um, really smart AI, it won't be about data. It will be about something else. Like if you compare um, machines to human beings, human beings don't need troves of data uh, to have the kind of intelligence that we're after. Yeah, actually, if I could just pile on Carissa's point. Carissa makes a very important point. I think in many respects, the, the paradigm for AI development is actually is, itself is changing. So if you look at some of the most impressive techniques that have happened, so look at, for example, uh, what DeepMind did with uh, with uh, you know, AlphaFold or even Mu Zero, uh, which is quite mind blowing in its own regard, it, they were not as data intensive as some of the other developments before. So I think this uh, the the view that data will always be the, the you know the gating driving factor here, I think will change depending on what arena we're talking about. So even the, so, the nature of AI itself. I mean, we now have. Examples of one-shot learning, for example. Uh, these are different ways that you know don't require as much data-hungry algorithms as much. Uh, we also know that in some cases, with large with large transformer models that we've seen now, pre-training can actually obviate, uh, in some cases, the need for even more data beyond what you already have in pre-trained algorithms. So I think the field itself is changing quite a bit. That's a brilliant example of how the ethics needs to be attuned to the actual realities in the research. Thank you so much to our three panelists. I'm really, really grateful to you for participating in this event. And I'm gonna pass over to our MC, Michael Cunningham. 
Well, I'd like to just echo uh, my thanks uh, to Reed Hoffman and James Manika and Carissa Lees. Uh, really just exceeded our expectations. A real wonderful panel. We, we uh, despite John Tussauds' best efforts, we, we didn't get to all the questions, uh, which I think actually is a good sign of that there are a, a few dozen left to be asked, which basically indicates that hopefully we can do this again. Uh, and revisit this topic and uh, hopefully reconvene this panel and, and do other panel discussions. But it certainly is a clear indication of the importance of this topic, uh, the timeliness of the Institute for Ethics and AI, and, and as was alluded to, Oxford's convening power to be able to bring together uh, some of the uh, best people from around the world to look at these important questions uh, for the benefit of all. So uh, on that note, uh, I just again like to thank the panel, uh, thank Professor John Tasoulis, uh, there'll be a slide after uh, we end the session that will provide more information on the Institute for Ethics and AI, so please explore that uh, information. Uh, and uh, my colleagues and I uh, thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you at some of our future sessions during this week uh, and, and further afield. So um, at that note, again, thank you for joining us and uh, stay well. Thanks, everyone.